Are we living with life tough questions? Why there is suffering in this world? Do you want to know? We welcome you for our regular monthly Sabbath afternoon forum. This Sabbath we are very privileged to have with us Dr. John Beckham from Andrews University. He is going to present a very important topic and that is on theodicy. This is going to take place this Sabbath afternoon at 3.15 p.m. October 17th. Prayer. Prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for adding a Sabbath in our, day, uh, in our life, Lord. Lord, we do thank you for arranging this wonderful forum for us, Lord. Lord, as we are going to start this program with some songs, Lord, let your name be only be glorified, Lord. We ask this Phimosis in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For the first song, let's sing Faith of a Father's Living Still. in Jesus.
for the next song let's sing what a plushy what a jolly joining us in song service we would like to thank the ed thomas youth for uh, their wonderful uh, leading in our in, in our song service and uh, uh, sorry for the e- video i mean so the audio was not so clear but we want to thank the lord for the youth and their ministry towards us now i'd like to call upon um, Mrs. Sharon Clinton to do the welcome and opening prayer. Thank you, Sir Anish. Uh, good afternoon and happy Sabbath, everyone. It's so nice to have you all join us uh, for this special Sabbath forum. I'm so glad that uh, our Sabbath afternoons are not in vain. Instead, we have decided to use it in a very productive manner. And I pray that uh, today would be a blessing to all of us who are gathered here. um before we uh, start off with our service i would like to read a passage uh, written by paul the apostle um to young timothy from second uh, timothy chapter 2 verse 15 and i would be reading from um, new king james version it says be diligent to present yourself approved to god a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth i hope uh, we would take this seriously as christians as individuals especially as um the ambassadors of god so you and i would be diligent in order to present ourselves uh, before god on that day of uh, judgment so that god would be proud of all that we have done for him i take this privilege um on behalf of for the division of religious studies of spicer adventist university to welcome all our students our faculty and many who have joined us from uh, uh, the other churches across india and a special welcome goes to dr john thank you so much for uh, taking this time to be with us and uh, being able to present a paper for us for which we are very grateful we pray that uh, this forum would be a blessing to all those who have gathered us the ones who have joined us on youtube also on this uh, zoom meeting may god bless and be with you all as you take part in this uh, forum and learn a lot about what the lord has for us through dr Be- uh, peckham we also pray for god's um, anoint anointment upon uh, dr peckham as he speaks to us let us bow our heads for a word of prayer heavenly father we're so grateful for all that you've done in our lives we're so grateful for the blessing of life that we have received and also for this beautiful sabbath hours so that we can commune with you and learn from the word of uh, the scriptures that you have given to us 
Help us so that this time that we spent in your word would be a blessing to all of us so that we would learn to become individuals who would do the best that we can with the abilities that you have given us. We pray for Dr. John Peckham. Use him mightily so that um, all of us gathered here would be blessed through the presentation and also we would be able to pass on the information to the rest of the world through what we learned today. All these blessings I ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Sharon. I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Mohan Rajasrail, the Dean of our uh, division, to introduce the speaker to the audience. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. It is my privilege this afternoon to introduce the speaker of this hour, Dr. John Peckham. Dr. John Peckham is a professor at uh, Andrews University, the Department of Theology and Christian Philosophy. I have not really personally met him or known him, but uh, I am so glad that uh, they are all introduced to him today through this forum. And we want to thank uh, Mr. Anish for uh, making this possible for each one of us. I wish to all of you good afternoon, but I think for Dr. Peckham, it's a very early morning. I really want to thank you, Dr. Peckham, for uh, uh, sacrificing your sleep to get up quite early in the morning to be with each one of us and to take part in this uh, forum this afternoon. This uh, activity is something that we have been doing for quite some time and uh, uh, an event where a, a lot of uh, uh, ideas are exchanged and a lot of discussion uh, evolves around this uh, forum. Just to say a little bit more about Dr. Peckham. Dr. Peckham joined the seminary at Andrews University in 2013, and he received the Daniel Augsburger Excellence in Teaching Award in 2016. Previously, Dr. Peckham pastored the Indiana Conference and thereafter, he taught a number of years at Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas, where he received the Educator of the Year Award in 2012. Dr. Peckham is the author, author of several books, including The Love of God, a Canonical Model, which came out in 2015, um, then The Canonical Theology, which came out in 2016. Uh, Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict and the Problem of Evil, which came out in 2018, and the Doctrine of God, introducing the big question and his upcoming, uh, where well, this came out in 2019. So you see, almost every year, uh, he's been publishing a book, amazing feat, and I really uh, admire him for what he's doing. And his upcoming book is entitled Divine Attributes, Knowing the Covenantal God of Scripture, which is expected to come in the year 2021, next year, in the month of March. Dr. John is married to Brenda, a registered nurse, and they have one son, Joel, who is their pride and joy. So this afternoon, we are really very, very privileged to have Dr. Beckham here with us. Um, as you know, he, the topic that has been chosen for this afternoon is a very, very important one, a uh, very significant one, an area that many people have a lot of questions over. And the title is uh, Theodicy, Why There is Suffering in the World Today. Uh, as you see, this word it comes from two Greek words, theos and decay. Theos is God and, the, and decay is justice. So we're really talking about 
the justice of God, the vindication of divine providence in view of the existence of evil in this world. Theodicy is an attempt to reconcile the power and goodness attributed to God with the presence of evil in the human experience. So this is a very challenging topic and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Beckham will uh, really expound on this. And uh, this afternoon, we are very, very privileged to have Dr. Beckham to present this paper. And without taking much time, I'd like to hand over this time to our guest uh, speaker, Dr. John Time is here. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have a, a presentation uh, to accompany uh, my words. And it is a, a very, very significant topic that we're dealing with, the problem of evil. And I'm going to present to you just a few thoughts on what I call a theodicy of love. So first of all, the problem, as we just heard introduced already, it, the simplest way to frame it is, if God is good, why is there evil? And to expand that a bit into the classical formulation of this problem, the question goes like this. If God is all-powerful, entirely good, and all-knowing, why does evil occur and so much of it? If God is all-powerful, he would have the power to prevent evil. If he's entirely good, then presumably he would want to prevent all evil. And of course, if he's all knowing, no evil takes him by surprise. So then why does evil occur and so much of it? The problem is not merely an academic problem. It's not merely a modern problem or contemporary issue. It's a problem we find voiced even in the words of scripture. And each one of us have been touched by the evil in this world, sadly. And we see this uh, angst, and suffering vo given voice to in the Bible with people even crying out to God for answers. So in the book of Job, Job cries out, when I looked for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, darkness came. In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet writes, why does the way of the guilty prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? In Malachi, the question is asked, where is the God of justice. And again in Jeremiah, why have these things happened to me? And the psalmist writes, why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in the times of trouble? So this is not merely an academic question. It is uh, very near and dear to my heart. And whatever else we say, and whatever else I say in the presentation today, I want to make it very clear that evil itself cannot be justified. Evil is evil, and it cannot be explained away. And what I am attempting to do in part today is show how we can still have confidence in the goodness and love of God in spite of evil without in any way trying to downplay the seriousness or magnitude of evil. I hope you understand the difference. Evil is an enemy. It's an enemy of God, and God will triumph over it and entirely eradicate it. So whatever else we say, Please, uh, please take nothing that I say after this as in any way trivializing or justifying evil. Secondly, what I'm presenting today is primarily with regard to this philosophical problem about how we can understand and have confidence in God in light of evil in the world. That's different from the question of how we ourselves cope with evil in our lives and suffering in our lives. And that's different than the issue. Often when people are suffering uh, acute, acutely, the last thing they need is a kind of theological discussion or explanation about evil, right? And so I want to differentiate those very clearly. What we want to do with anyone who is suffering or undergoing evil is draw near to them with tangible comfort and presence. There may be another time when they're, they're wrestling in their mind with how to reconcile what is happening in the world with, with their faith in God, or maybe they even struggle with faith in God. And at that time, it might be appropriate to have the discussion we're having today, but I want to differentiate those very clearly, right? And so nothing that we say today actually resolves the actual problem of evil, which is evil itself. Only God can remove the evil and suffering around us, and he will, okay? And so I want to make those, those two uh, different ways of approaching the problem very, very clear at the outset. 
So whatever else we say, again, evil cannot be justified or explained away. So in what I will present, I'm drawing largely from my work, The Odyssey of Love, uh, in a very brief uh, summary form. I, I, can't, I can barely scratch the surface, but hopefully we'll go a little bit deeper in the question and answer time. Uh, but in the presentation itself uh, and anything I say today, I make no attempt to try to answer all the questions about the problem of evil. I'm just going to present to you seven thoughts that I believe may help us in thinking about the problem of evil. But again, only God can resolve the problem of evil. The question today is how can we coherently, can, can we coherently affirm God's goodness and perfect love in the meantime while we await God's final resolution? to the problem of evil. So my first thought, my first reflection on the problem of evil, and this is as important as anything else I will say, there are many things we do not know. So we must approach this problem with humility. We should always approach theology with humility. Whenever we talk about God, we are on holy ground. And this issue especially, there are many things we do not know. And many uh, of the problems people have in thinking about the problem of evil is rushing ahead of what is shown and what is revealed. And we want to be careful and recognize there are so many things we do not know about this and many other things. This itself is very prominently put forth throughout the scriptures. I'm just sharing, you a couple, sharing with you a couple of verses from Job, but you can find it all throughout the Bible. Uh, but Job himself, when he's trying to wrestle with the suffering that he underwent, he cries out to God. And when God responds to him, uh, God says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge. And again, he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. One translation uh, of the first verse uh, says, why do you talk so much when you know so little, right? There are many things we do not know. And Job himself recognizes this at the end of the book of Job. He says, therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. For me which I did not know. And I think this is the response that we can give as well when we come to the end of our attempts to understand. And we recognize there's more. There's still more questions. And we can say, well, there are things that I don't know, but God knows. And God is love, and I can trust him. Okay? So many things we cannot know. And the fact that we may not know the answer to some of our questions doesn't mean there isn't a good answer. Some people think if I cannot understand what God's reasons are, for acting or not acting the way that he does, then he must not have any good reasons for it. But that does not follow. If God is God and we are mere creatures, why should we expect to be in a position to know what God's reasons are unless he has revealed them in scripture, right? So there are many things we do not know. A simple example of this, I'm, I remember a number of years ago when my son was less than two years old at the time, my wife and I had to take him to the hospital uh, to have his blood drawn to see if he was in need of a medical procedure uh, that could be life-saving. And so as we were there, he was very young, he was a little bit scared, and so the nurse uh, asked my wife and I to hold him down while she stuck him with a needle to draw blood from his arm. And again, he was less than two years old, he was uh, too young to talk at the time, but I, I'll never forget the look in his eyes. And the look in his eyes said it all. Uh, Daddy, why are you letting this happen to me? why are you holding me down? Why am I being hurt? And there was nothing that I could have said to my son, Joel, at that time that would have helped him to understand why I was doing what I was doing. I had good reasons for what I was doing. What I did for him was only out of love and it was for his best good, given the circumstances. I had no better alternative available to me, but there was no words in which he would understand what was happening. And in many cases, we are like that in relationship to God. There are things that go far beyond our understanding. And so I want to make that our first point, and, and hopefully you'll remember that throughout the entire presentation. There are, there's more that we can say beyond that, but when all of our answers fail, remember there is a God who is love and he knows, and there are many things that are mysterious to us. But that brings me to the second reflection, the second thought. The Bible teaches consistently that God does not always get what he wants. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they think about this issue is they think that whatever happens must be what God wants to happen or what God is causing to happen. But evil is against God's will. Evil is what God does not want. 
And the Bible consistently tells us that things happen that God does not want to happen, which proves that creatures have free will. Because the reason that things happen that God does not want to happen is because God has granted creatures freedom and creatures tragically have misused it to do evil. So we see in Isaiah 64, this is God speaking. He says, I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen. And they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. And that Hebrew word there that's translated delight, it can also be translated will or take pleasure in. So they chose in direct opposition to God's will. And that is one basic definition of evil, right? So God doesn't want it, but it happens nonetheless because humans or other creatures exercise their free will in ways that God does not want. Another text, Psalm 81, verses 11 through 14. Again, God speaking. My people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart, to walk in their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would quickly deliver them. And again, in the New Testament, Jesus gives voice to this very same thing. In Luke 13, 34, Jesus declares, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. And every time I, I read that in my mind's eye, I can see the tears in the eyes of our Savior. What he wanted, he willed one thing, and they willed the opposite. That's just explicit in the text. So never forget this, whether you are suffering or others that you love are suffering. There are many things that happen in this world that God does not want. And as we will see later, when you are suffering, when anyone is suffering, God is actually suffering with you. So that is point number two. God does not always get what he wants. And evil in this world occurs because creatures will otherwise than God wants. If everyone always did what God preferred, there would only be goodness and love and peace. Always. Like you see at the bottom of the screen, that straight line. That would be history. Everything would be perfect bliss. Unfortunately, the world we live in is more like the top, even much worse than that, right? You have history going all these different directions. But it's not because of any fault in God, and it's not because God wanted it this way. It's because of all of the bad decisions of creatures that God is working with and working around. And sometimes if you read the Bible, you read the Old Testament narratives and the New Testament narratives, you may read the stories and you might think, wow, the way God is working seems to be a kind of circuitous route. Well, it is, because God is working with and around the decisions of creatures. And that brings me to point number three, which is very closely related to point number two. God grants and respects free will to creatures, even when creatures do evil, because it is a necessary prerequisite of love. Love must be freely given and freely received. This is why a robot cannot love. There's many reasons a robot cannot love, but one of them is because they do not have freedom. If you could control someone's mind or program all of their thoughts, you still would not be able to program them to love you because the very fact that you control their thoughts or could program them would take away the possibility of love. And so love requires free will. And because God is love, and because love is the greatest value in the universe, God consistently grants free will to creatures and respects that free will for the sake of love. Now that in a nutshell is what is often referred to as the free will defense when it comes to the problem of evil. And this free will defense is very well respected. It has been articulated in very technical philosophical language by many philosophers, including recently in recent decades, a very well respected Christian philosopher by the, name, by the name of Alvin Plantinga. And he articulated this free will defense that evil occurs because creatures exercise their free will wrongly. And if God grants free will, it's not up to him whether creatures misuse their will. He's articulated that in such a powerful way that even many atheists have recognized that it resolves what is called the logical problem of evil. That is, it actually resolves the question of how there could be a God who is all powerful and entirely good, and yet there's evil in the world. Because you add another premise, and that is that God has granted free will. Now, those who are antagonistic to theistic faith 
even though they recognize many of them that it resolves the logical problem of evil, they say, well, okay, it may answer why there is some evil in the world, but they say it doesn't answer why there is so much evil in the world. And they go beyond the logical problem of evil to something they call the evidential problem of evil. So, okay, God might grant freedom, but then why is there so much? Why isn't there less evil in the world? And we could put it this way with regard to the free will defense. What about evils that God could seemingly prevent without undermining free will? What about evils where God could stop something without taking away anyone's free will? And to address this question, we need to go beyond the free will defense without leaving it behind. The basic answer to the problem of evil is that evil is a result of creature misuse of creaturely free will. And God granted free will for the sake of love. But there is more to the story that helps us to see a framework that makes sense about uh, this question. What about evils that God could prevent without undermining free will? So that brings me to the fourth point. And this is the one I'm going to focus on uh, for a little bit here. There is much more to the story, a cosmic conflict, or what Avenists often refer to as the great controversy. Now, this idea of a cosmic conflict is not unique to the Adventist faith, although it is uniquely essential to Adventist theology, but it is recognized elsewhere. One uh, very famous Christian author who himself converted uh, from atheism to Christianity during his life, he wrote about his experience in his, in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis. He wrote, one of the things that surprised me when I first read the New Testament seriously was that it talked so much about a dark power in the universe a mighty evil spirit who was held to be the power behind death and disease and sin. Christianity thinks this dark power was created by God and was good when he was created and went wrong. This universe is at war and it is a civil war, a rebellion. And we are living in a part of the universe occupied by the rebel, enemy occupied territory. That is what this world is. And that is one uh, very good way of explaining the idea of a cosmic conflict between God and Satan. Now in scripture, this cosmic conflict is represented in many different places. But one place I like to go to show it very quickly and succinctly is the parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. It says, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. What kind of seed? Good seed. That's very important. The man sows good seed. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And tares are a noxious kind of weed. And he went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The servants of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And if you were to translate that question, to the question people ask about the problem of evil, they say, God, didn't you create a good world? Why then is there evil in it? You see the parallel, right? And look at the answer that Jesus gives to this question. And he said to them, an enemy has done this. And later he explicitly identifies the enemy as the devil. So right there, you just explicitly have uh, Jesus declaring the cosmic conflict and the cosmic conflict being responsible for evil. An enemy has done this, but it doesn't stop there. Then the servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? And this is the second question people ask. Okay, so an enemy has done this, right? The, the devil has introduced evil. So why doesn't God just destroy him and eradicate evil right now? Why not just get rid of it? Just exercise his power. But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. So in some sense, according to this text, if God were to prematurely uproot evil, it would have worse consequences than the way he is dealing with evil, right? And the text doesn't give us all of the answers, but it tells us for some good reasons that God knows to uproot evil prematurely would actually be worse than to deal with it the way that God is dealing with it in his wisdom. So he says, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather up the tares and buy them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So there is a day coming when God will eradicate evil, and in his wisdom, there are good reasons 
for the sake of the wheat, that is for the sake of the good, that he is not removing evil prematurely in a way that will actually damage uh, the good. And as I, as I mentioned before, we don't have to guess who the enemy is. Later, Jesus explains this parable. He says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's a reference to Jesus himself. And the field is the world. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So very explicitly, you have a, a very simple cosmic conflict theodicy in this parable that Jesus explains. Why is there evil in this world if God created the world good? An enemy has done this. That is the words of Jesus. But there's still more about this cosmic conflict. Because many people ask, how could there even be any conflict between God and any creatures? At first glance, if you don't understand the nature of the conflict, it seems impossible. Because how could there be a conflict between an all-powerful God and any mere creatures? If the conflict was one of sheer power, there could be no conflict, right? Because God is all-powerful. So that means the cosmic conflict cannot be a conflict over sheer power. It must be a conflict of some other kind. And scripture reveals that the cosmic conflict, what we often call the great controversy, is primarily a dispute over God's character, over his righteousness and his love, which has been caused by the devil's slanderous allegations against God that sadly some creatures have believed, that claim that God is not fully good, God is not fully just, and God's government is not pure righteousness and love. We see from the very beginning that the great controversy is about God's character. From the very beginning, the devil slanders God's name. In the Garden of Eden, before there was any sin in this world, we are told in Genesis 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now notice that, that that question there, this leading question, it's almost the exact opposite of the actual command that God gave to them, right? Because God actually told them you can eat from any tree in the garden except one. But the serpent twisted and turns it around and then uh, asked Eve to answer the question. So the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Which is to say, among other things, God is a liar or God has lied to you. And at this moment, Eve and anyone reading this story, imagine if you were reading it for the first time and maybe you don't know who the serpent is. And maybe you don't know even who this God is who's just introduced in the first two chapters. At this point, you know one thing, someone is lying. Either God has lied or the serpent has lied, right? And Eve has to make a choice. And we also have to make a choice. This is what the cosmic conflict comes down to, whether we trust God and we can only love God if we trust him or we don't. Whether God is telling the truth, whether God is righteous and love or whether the enemy's allegations against him are true. The serpent said, you surely will not die. And he doesn't just claim God is a liar. He then claims there is a motivation for God supposedly lying to Eve. Verse five, for he says, God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he claims that God lies to them because he doesn't really want what's best for them. And this is Satan's slanderous allegation against God's character from the very beginning. And it is the root of all evil and disharmony and strife in the world. It is because of a breaking from God's love and recognizing and trusting God's commands implicitly. So there and many other places throughout scripture, we could see that the cosmic conflict is primarily a dispute over God's character, his character of love, caused by the devil slanderous allegations against his goodness, justice, and government. But such a conflict, one regarding allegations against God's character, cannot be settled by sheer power. Only a demonstration can answer allegations against someone's character. And God answers the allegations, not for himself, but for the sake of the universe, for the sake of love. Because if humans or other creatures think God is a tyrant, we cannot love him or trust him implicitly. But the entire harmony of the universe depends on everyone recognizing God's goodness and love, which is the best good for everyone. But he cannot simply defeat these allegations by showing his power. If you think of anyone in power 
say, the governor or, or mayor or overseer of, of a town. Let's say they are accused of corruption. And then they use their power to stamp out those who are raising the questions about their leadership. That would only make the allegations seem stronger, right? It would only make the problem worse. And so before God exercises his power to remove evil, he defeats the allegations by a demonstration of his character and his love, which ultimately takes place at the cross and through the process of atonement we see in the sanctuary. So what have we seen so far? Just to recap. Number one, there is a cosmic conflict between the kingdom of God and the devil and his minions, fallen angels who are fallen creatures who rebelled against God's government. Number two, this conflict is not a conflict of sheer power, which would be impossible given God's omnipotence. It is a conflict over character that includes allegations against God's judgment and government. And that brings us to number three, the devil, whom Jesus himself calls the ruler of this world, possesses some real power and authority, some genuine but limited and temporary rulership in this world, which is quickly approaching its end. Now, where do we see this? Over and over in the Bible, we see that God himself is working within some parameters in this great controversy. One place you can see this is Daniel chapter 10. We're told in Daniel chapter 10 that Daniel had received a message that was true and one of a great conflict which already brings to mind the idea of a great controversy. Then in verse two, in those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. How long had he been mourning? Three weeks. And finally, someone comes to him in response to his prayers and his mourning. And then an angel comes to him, dropping down to verse 12. And he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Now, what has happened here? Daniel has been mourning and praying for three weeks. And the angel comes and says, from the first day, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words, but I was withstood and delayed by the prince of Persia. And many biblical scholars believe the prince of Persia is actually a fallen angel that was trying to influence the human king of Persia. Maybe Satan himself, maybe another fallen angel, but some demonic power. But whether or not one thinks it is the human king of Persia or a demonic ruler behind the human king of Persia, the question still arises, how could this be? How can an angel sent by God be withstood for three weeks? In order for this to happen, God must not be exercising all of his power. Because if God exercises power, an angel could be anywhere he wants immediately, right? By snapping his finger, so to speak. So God must not be exercising all of his power. The kingdom of God, including the way angels operate, must be operating within some parameters in the cosmic conflict. What I call, for lack of a better terminology, rules of engagement. Now, what are rules of engagement? In my view, not merely this passage, but many texts of scripture indicate that the cosmic conflict, the great controversy takes place within some consistent rules, consistent parameters, what I call rules of engagement, within which those who oppose God are allowed to operate temporarily. And of course, if there were no such rules, if there was no such freedom for them to oppose God, they couldn't oppose God in the first place, and they couldn't actually ever make their case, and the allegations against God's character could not be settled. So one way to define these rules of engagement the rules of engagement are those things to which God has committed himself in relationship to creatures, including any commitments he might have made with regard to the extent of rulership and jurisdiction that is temporarily afforded to the enemy, that is the devil, by the fall of humans within the cosmic conflict. Now note this very carefully. It is not that God gave this world to the devil. Humans gave this world by falling in the garden. And by falling, the enemy was afforded some rulership, limited and temporary, within this world, within some parameters, because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Now you see many, many glimpses of these kinds of parameters or rules that even God is working within in the cosmic conflict in many places. First of all, we already saw Daniel 10. We're gonna to go to Job here in just a moment. But we see also that Jesus himself refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. 
Now that would make no sense if there was not some sense in which Satan has some rulership, some jurisdiction. It's limited and it's temporary, but it is real. And in Luke 4, the, Satan just makes this claim in the temptation of Christ. The devil said to him, I will give you all this domain in its glory. This is after he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, if you just bow down to me, I'll give it all to you. You don't have to die on the cross. I'll just give it to you now. He says, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Then in Matthew 8, you have demons in a demon possessed uh, individual who cry out to Jesus and they say, what have you to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Which implies that they know they have a limited time to act, but there is a future judgment that is coming. In Luke 22, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Then in Mark 6, we find that in his hometown of Nazareth, it says Jesus could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. So somehow, Jesus' miracle working ability was limited in that place. And in that context, it was based on their lack of faith. And then later in Mark 9, a man brings his demon-possessed son to the disciples, and they couldn't cast the demon out. And then he comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, if you believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man says to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And just as a sidebar, I love that verse because Jesus doesn't say to him, come back to me when you have more faith, right? He takes that limited faith of the man who says, I'm not sure if I have enough faith, but Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And he heals his son and he casts out the demon. But then later the disciples ask Jesus, why couldn't we cast out that demon? And this is what he says to them. Some kinds of unclean spirits can come out only through prayer and faith. Specifically said, this kind can only come out through prayer which tells you there are some rules of engagement that even is influencing the demonic realm. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes that Satan blocked our way from going to the Thessalonians. And then the book of Revelation presents us in broad sweeping view. You have the dragon who is Satan, the dragon ruler who is behind all the oppressive kingdoms of the earth who oppress and persecute God's people. He gives power and authority over to the beast from the sea and to the beast from the earth which means he himself must have that power and authority. Is this making sense to you? But he knows also, according to Revelation 12, that his time is short. So there are some limited jurisdiction that is given to Satan because of the fall of this world, and it is limited and temporary, but it is real. And we see these rules of engagement also operative in the case of Job. In Job 1, verses 6 through 8, it says, Now there was a day... When the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, we're not told very much about these sons of God, but this phrase is, is used throughout the Bible to refer to what scholars call a heavenly council or a heavenly court, which involves celestial creatures that are involved in some council or court in the presence of God. And Satan, at least on this day, comes among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it, which many biblical scholars take him to be saying, I have a right to be here because I'm the ruler of the earth. That's my territory. Then verse eight, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Now, two things should be immediately obvious from these verses. First of all, there must already be some ongoing dispute between the Lord and Satan, because otherwise it would make no sense to say, have you considered my servant Job? This is obviously a question he's raising in the midst of a conflict that is ongoing, because it would make no sense if I said to you right now, you're listening to this presentation, I said, have you considered my son Joel? And you'd be like, what are you talking about, right? That, that doesn't make any sense in the context of our conversation. It makes sense because there's already a dispute, and he's raising Job's name about some ongoing dispute in the background, and has something to do with God's government, God's righteousness because he then declares his judgment in favor of Job, that Job is blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. 
but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Now notice what Satan is claiming. First of all, you put a hedge or a fence around him so that I can't, uh, I can't touch him and I can't prove to you my claim that he isn't really righteous. He just serves you out of fear. Now, this is not only a slanderous allegation against Job's character, it's also slander against God's character. Why? Because God has already declared Job to be righteous. And Satan says, no, your judgment is false. Your judgment is unjust. And your protection of Job is unjust. You have these limits, what I call rules of engagement around him. And you need to change them. Otherwise, I can't make my case. And then in the heavenly council, the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. There's so much more to say about this episode, and maybe we'll say more in the question and answer period. But for now, I want you to notice in this story that Satan charges that Job fears God only because God has put a fence around him and would curse God if met with calamity. This, again, is an allegation against Job's character, but also amounts to an allegation against God's character because it contradicts God's earlier judgment that Job was blameless, upright, and God-fearing. And the fence that Satan refers to indicates there were existing limits on Satan's action, which I call rules of engagement. And these rules of engagement were modified slightly before the heavenly council in Job 1 and in Job 2. These dialogues between God and Satan in Job 1 through 2 are not private ones. And this is very important to recognize. This is not merely a conversation between God and Satan. This is a dialogue that takes place in a courtroom. So Satan is bringing an accusation in a courtroom against God, and God is responding to that. So these are part of legal proceedings before a heavenly court, part of a celestial courtroom drama. And God is acting in the way that he does because he is taking into account all of the minds involved, and he is doing what is best to defeat the allegation, not for himself, but for the good, for the sake of the entire universe. So this is before a heavenly court, which consists of celestial beings, who provide some input relative to what transpires on earth. And this heavenly council is depicted in many places throughout scripture that I won't go through now, but just so you know, this is a, a, a very prominent motif in scripture. In this heavenly council, in this heavenly courtroom context, God agrees to allow the limits on Satan's power, these rules of engagement to be extended. The alternative being that Satan's allegations would remain an open question in the heavenly council, and God might appear to be abusing his power to shut down an investigation of his character and government. In Job, then, the rules of engagement are the product of some heavenly court proceedings, such that they are not subject to being unilaterally determined or modified by either God or Satan. And because they are the result of heavenly court proceedings, they may be far from ideal. In other words, they are not set up just the way God would prefer. They're set up in a way that takes into account what has taken place in the heavenly court. So one question we can raise at this juncture, but why would God agree to any such rules of engagement? Well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, if serious allegations are brought against a person in power, the best and maybe the only way to defeat those allegations would be to allow for a free, fair, and open investigation. If the allegations threaten the entire government of love, they cannot simply be swept under the rug. And given that allegations against one's character cannot be defeated in the minds of others by the exercise of sheer power, it may be that there was no preferable way, not only for God himself, but for all concerned in the heavenly council and beyond, to respond to the enemy's allegations against God and his government, except to allow an open hearing and demonstration. Yet such an open hearing would require something like rules of engagement. Now, these rules of engagement do not pose any limit on God's sheer power, But because God never lies and God never breaks his promises, any agreement that God enters into would effectively limit morally the exercise of God's power to eliminate or mitigate evils that fall within the enemy's temporary jurisdiction. If this is so, there may be many instances where God would otherwise choose to prevent and or mitigate evil occurrences, but doing so would be against the rules of engagement. It would be against the rulership that was given over to the devil by Adam and Eve when they fell. And God cannot do that morally because he cannot go against his character. And God did not unilaterally decide those rules. And he cannot unilaterally modify or contravene 
those rules. If he were to do so, then that would just prove Satan's allegations that he's not righteous and just. So Satan has cohorts are temporarily granted some real jurisdiction in this world. It's limited according to these rules of engagement, which correspondingly limit God's power to eliminate or mitigate evil. Now that is point number five, the longest of our points, the others are briefer. In this cosmic conflict, there are rules of engagement, parameters agreed upon in heavenly court within which the allegations raised against God can be settled without damaging love. Now, if this is so, insofar as God agrees to rules of engagement, his future action would be morally limited. As such, some evils may fall within the temporary domain of the kingdom of darkness. So it may be that God strongly desires to prevent every occurrence of evil, and I believe that he does. But doing so in some instances would either, one, go against the creaturely free will necessary for love. Number two, contravene, go against the, the rules of engagement, wise result in greater evil or less flourishing of love. Anytime there is event of evil and we don't understand why it is not prevented by God, one of those three things, or maybe more of those three things may be at play. And God has good and loving and righteous reasons for why he refrains from acting in ways that we think would be best, because they might not actually be best given everything God knows, given the rest of the story. Now, this was highlighted and driven home by a children's story I read uh, when I was a young boy in Guide Magazine. It was a serial. Each chapter came out uh, every week. And the story is called The Sword of Dennis Anwick. It's a story about a young boy living in medieval Europe in medieval times. And we learn very early in the story that Dennis absolutely hates the king of his land. And as the story goes on, we learn that the reason Dennis hates the king of his land is because when he was a very young boy, his parents were very sick. And the king's soldiers came and dragged him away from his parents. And for that, he despised and hated the king until he learned something. Through a series of events, he came to stumble upon the king's own book in the king's castle. And the title of that book was titled The Chronicles of Pestilence, being an account of the dread black death and times following. And as he read the king's book, he read the king's own word, and the king said, it pains me to do it, but I separate the dying from the living to save the living from this horrible plague. And he realized for the first time that his parents were dying from the bubonic plague, and the only reason the king had separated him from them was for his good. There was more to the story, many things he did not know, but God was always and only doing what was best for him. And this is number six. God always does everything he can, given the alternatives, to bring about the best good for all of us, and he will finally eradicate evil forevermore. Now, this is raised very clearly in Isaiah 5. In Isaiah 5, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah himself sings what he calls a song about God. He says, let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around and removed its stones and planted it with the tree in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. Or literally in the Hebrew, it produced stink fruit. So what has happened here? The vineyard owner, God, has done everything he could for his vineyard. And then it produces rotten fruit. Now in verse 3, the speaker shifts to God himself. God says, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. So God calls on people to judge him, which, by the way, no tyrant does. No tyrant says, go ahead and judge me. See whether what I have done is right. Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones or stink fruit? And that is the question. What more could he do? But Isaiah 5 is not the end of the story because in Matthew 21, Jesus picks up on this question, what more could he do? And Jesus tells a parable. He says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. What's he referring to? He's referring to Isaiah 5. And so if you're reading this parable or hearing this parable, you should have the question in your mind. What question? What more could he do? That's the question. 
Then verse 34, Jesus continues. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. These are God's prophets who they killed. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? This is the question that I leave you with. What more could he do that he has not done? If you are tempted, even after everything else that God has revealed, if we're tempted to wonder, is God really good? Is God really righteous? Is he really doing everything that he could do? Look to the God who gave himself in Christ to suffer for us on the cross. And you will see that that God can be trusted. If there was any preferable way, wouldn't he have chosen it? Even if only to spare himself the suffering he underwent. And God did not only suffer for us at the cross, that is a supreme demonstration of God's love, but actually the God of the Bible suffers whenever you suffer. Whenever my son is hurt. I hurt because I love him. And whenever you are hurting, God hurts with you. And so God suffers most of all because he actually suffers everything that everyone in the world suffers. But he considered this world to be worth it. And this is why Paul can promise in Romans 8.18 that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. What more could he do? He has done everything that could be done. In the meantime, we can look to the cross and have confidence that the God who suffers with us in love can be trusted because he has done everything he could do. And in the end, we have this promise that when the great controversy is over, he will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crying or pain. For all these things are gone forever. So those are my seven thoughts. There are many things we do not know. God does not always get what he wants. God grants and respects free will, even when creatures do evil, because it's a necessary prerequisite of love. But there is more to the story, a cosmic conflict. And in this cosmic conflict, there are rules of engagement, parameters agreed upon in the heavenly court, within which the allegations raised against God can be settled without damaging love, not for God's sake, but for our sake. In the midst of this, God always does everything he can, given the alternatives, to bring about the best good for all of us, and he will finally eradicate evil forevermore. And in the meantime, we can look to the cross and have confidence that this God suffers with us, and this God can be trusted because God is love. Thank you. Um, uh, to have uh, summarized uh, this book in, in such a short time, uh, I guess, you know, unless one goes uh, in the speed of a bullet train, it's not really possible. And I sincerely want to appreciate uh, Dr. Peckham for, uh, uh, you know, it was in such a speed and, but yet understandable. And thank you so much, uh, for making it more uh, clear and easy for us to understand. Now, uh, we have uh, two responses, one from faculty and one from a, uh, from a student. And I would invite Dr. Jason Israel at this time to make the first response. They may have a question, so I would like to request Dr. Peckham to take note of that. And after their responses, you make a uh, you answer or you make your response. And then we have a question answer sections. Number of questions have come to us. Uh, we will read them and you may respond to them after that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peckham for that uh, very powerful presentation. Uh, one of the best I have, uh, I have uh, heard uh, in recent years. First of all, 
I want to appreciate you for uh, sacrificing your sleep, your rest, Friday night rest, and uh, uh, being with us, spending this uh, time with us. Uh, as you have concluded, God could be trusted. We can trust your words, and uh, we are we are blessed. We also, I also want to appreciate you for that uh, strong voice God has given you and uh, that preacher's story you have included um, to, to nail, um, uh, to make that point that God could be trusted. I have noted uh, three things. Um, Uh, I, I like that rules of engagement framework. It uh, this is a this is a very uh, very strong and uh, a biblical uh, framework that uh, you have developed through the Holy Spirit, uh, where God. Um, works within this framework, certain parameters um, that talks a lot about God and uh, about your understanding about God's character. And we praise God for it. Um, the second thing, I have also noted that uh, this conflict we are in, um, regardless of religion or background, every human being is uh, part of this cosmic conflict. And uh, I, I like the way you brought out, it's not a conflict of sheer power, but uh, it's a dispute over God's character. And uh, that's, uh, that's very enlightening for me. And uh, the final one, um, um, I, I've always wondered, uh, about the about God throwing open the books of heaven. I'm referring to the second phase of uh, judgment. The first phase, the investigative judgment. Second, millennial, and third, the executive or the white throne judgment. In the second phase of judgment during the one thousand years, where God will throw open the the records of heaven to all the righteous and uh, uh, it's actually God um, opening himself for um, his people to judge him. I Today I have got a very nice clue from your presentation, how you have connected ICF, uh, the parable in ICF 5 and Matthew 21. Um, I praise God for this enlightenment of God Ask, is uh, asking man to judge him. No tyrant would do that. No dictator would do that. Only a loving God would do that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful presentation. Very enlightening um, for all of us today. One question. I was uh, uh, wondering, you have referred to the parable um, that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, uh, the enemy has done this. And very true, the enemy has done this. And uh, in verse 30, I was wondering if there is any significance to this, uh, uh, this word. In uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. My question here is, uh, it, it appears that tares are taken care of first. And then the, uh, the wheat, is there any significance for this word first? Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you so much for that response. Uh, it is a, a blessing and privilege to be with you and to hear your words and, and the insights. Uh, I appreciate your response very, very much and resonate uh, with everything that you have said. With regard uh, to the question that you asked, I, I think there is significance there. I think for God to bring the final blessing to the good, to the wheat, he must deal with evil. Evil must be eradicated. So in the end, evil must be dealt with. Lo love must triumph and remove evil for the sake of goodness. There is a temporary time in which evil is allowed to continue, but this parable, in this parable, Jesus looks forward to the final judgment when evil is eradicated. And evil is, is dealt with first to show God's justice, to show God's righteousness. And he doesn't uh, just eradicate evil prematurely. He first defeats it by demonstration, and then he uproots it. So there will not be uh, any additional collateral damage. So I think it go shows that God is operating in an orderly way, in a way that manifests his love and his righteousness. And it shows us as well, I believe, that our understanding of the cosmic conflict should call us to action to bring about goodness and justice wherever we can in the world, because that is what God wants now, and he will bring it in the end. But in the meantime, there is our opportunity to help others who might be suffering, who might be in need. And if we understand that evil and suffering is the enemy's work, we will work against it, always in the spirit of love, always in the spirit of God's love and justice, but we will try to bring about uh, uh, goodness and justice in the meantime, while we wait for God's final judgment to finally remove evil. But we will try to alleviate people's suffering and show God's love wherever we go in the meantime. I would like to invite uh, Kristen George to kindly make his response. Sorry, you are not audible. Not audible. No. No, sorry. Um, uh, maybe by the time he fixes that, we will take up uh, maybe one question and then we will uh, get back to him for his response. Uh, the first question that I have here uh, sent to me by a student is, uh, how should a person accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior understand the moral struggle Yes, I think we should understand the moral struggle as a microcosm of the cosmic conflict. That is a small part of the cosmic conflict within it. All of us are part of the cosmic conflict, and we are called to make our own choice of where we will place our allegiance, where we will place our trust, and where we, where we will place our love. And the struggle of good and evil, the broader struggle, is also a struggle of good and evil within our hearts. We have, as the Apostle Paul uh, portrays it, this uh, sinful nature warring against us and, and wanting us to do evil. And it's only by surrender and submission to the God of love that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit to have the power from Christ to triumph, to turn away from evil, to confess and repent of our evil and call upon the only one who can make us righteous and turn us to him. So I think actually that the struggle is just the cosmic conflict within our individual lives where the enemy works against us, but God always works for us. Sadly, many people, when they think of sin and evil uh, and their own sin, they sometimes think of God as, as against them. But God is not against you. He is against the evil and the sin, which he wants to take away from you. But he loves you and he wants to redeem you. It's the enemy who is against you, who is accusing you before the court. God wants to declare you righteous. And he will declare you righteous by the blood of Jesus if you claim the blood of Jesus, which means you accept Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, and as your Lord. 
you accept his forgiveness and his leading in your life. There's so much more to say about that, uh, but those are just a few thoughts for now. Thank you. Another question. Uh, did God limit his omniscience to some extent in order to make room for free will that it will be practical in the lives of uh, his, the creatures that God created? Thank you for this question. This is a good question. So many people think um, that if God had omniscience, being all-knowing, particularly if he knows, has foreknowledge, that is knowledge beforehand of the free decisions of creatures, that would somehow undermine free will. I'm, I'm convinced that the Bible teaches both that God has knowledge of all future events, including all future free decisions of creatures. Um, I'm convicted the Bible teaches that. And the Bible also teaches that we have free will of the kind that we can do otherwise than God wants. That's technically called libertarian freedom. And for me, because I try to build my theology on what the Bible teaches, if both of those things are taught by the Bible, I, I feel bound to accept both of them, even if I don't know how they fit together. However, having said that, uh, philosophically, even though intuitively many people think if God knows my decision in advance, I don't have freedom at the time. When you actually look at that more carefully, there's actually no contradiction between God knowing my future decision and me still being free to make the decision at the time. Uh, I can't elaborate now on how that works precisely, but the short answer is nothing about God's knowledge undermines or limits or takes away your freedom. You are just as free to make decisions as you would be if God didn't have foreknowledge. And those two things are, are actually not incongruent. So I do not think, I do not think that God needs to limit his omniscience for us to have freedom. Uh, Jesus did while he was incarnate on the earth. Uh, there were some things that he did not know for a time because he was operating within the, the, the role of his humanity. So he was not using his divine power for his own benefit. But outside of the incarnation, I do not see evidence that God is limiting his omniscience. Uh, and free will, I believe, is perfectly consistent with God knowing all things, including the future. Thank you. Uh, another question by one of our faculty, Mr. Sandosh. Uh, he said, why suffering in the world? Is it a result of spiritual warfare? Yes, I think there's suffering in the world because of an enemy has done this. Is the simplest, if you just wanted one sentence of the theodicy of love in the Bible, an enemy has done this. Uh, creatures have misused their free will against God's desire. They have rebelled against his kingdom. They've been given that freedom for the sake of love. If God were to take away that freedom, there could be no love in the universe, but God himself is love, and love is the greatest value in the universe. And we need to always remember as horrible as evil is, and it is horrible, there's, there's no trivializing or mitigating. As horrible as it is, it is temporary. And in light of eternity that Paul points us to, there will be eternity of bliss and love. And God will not compromise that. He won't go against his character. He won't remove love just for this temporary season, when in fact that would be worse in the long run. And when we're able to see the end from the beginning, we're able to see in that phase of the judgment that was referred to earlier in the response, we'll be able to see that everything God has done was the most preferable avenue available to him. And if we could know everything he knows and love the way he loves, we would not prefer him to, to act any differently than he has throughout history because he has only and always done what is most good and loving. But for now, yes, the blame lies at the feet of all who have exercised their will against God, starting with the devil, but sadly including even us, for which we need to repent and ask for forgiveness and do our part to make the world around us a better place. Uh, in, the, in the name of Jesus' love and spread his love. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have uh, Christian back. Maybe we'll uh, take his response right now. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Thank uh, you. Um, once again, I thank you, Dr. Peckham, for your presentation, um, your, uh, your points on the free will, uh, the free will defense on our finite knowledge. Uh, we've heard this before. What was new for me is um, that God does not always get what he wants. And also what was new to me was uh, the rules of engagement framework. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving us a deeper understanding on great controversy, the cosmic conflict, and specifically these rules of engagement. Um, I noticed that um, you mentioned 
the importance of prayer and faith. Uh, I would like to uh, say that it helps me understand that um, prayer and faith has greater role in our lives, our spiritual lives, especially because of these rules of engagement. Um, because of these rules of engagement, the more we pray, the more God can work through us, the more faith we develop in God, uh, we will be able to survive uh, this warfare that we are in. Um, my question, sir, will be, uh, what other rules have you discovered in your study? Is there more to this? Can we know more or are we just limited to what you have mentioned? Thank you, sir, once again. Thank you very much for that response. And thank you for uh, emphasizing that point on faith and prayer. I, I think you are right that prayer opens up additional avenues for God to work uh, in, in our lives and the lives of those around us. And I think the rules of engagement are part of that. And I think it's part of the rules of engagement that God claims the right that when my people pray, then I will hear them, I will respond. And he has the moral right to do that within the cosmic conflict that the enemy cannot claim he is unrighteous in doing that. When it comes to more rules of engagement, yes, I think there is a lot of more evidence for rules of engagement. In the book, in the presentation, I mentioned just a few. In the book, I mentioned more, and there's even many more, but I tried to limit myself in the book to those that I thought were the most obvious and the least able to be dismissed in, in a scholarly academic context uh, because I wanted to put the best case forward. But I actually see evidence of the rules of engagement throughout scripture, anywhere that you see God working around uh, what appear to be impediments to his action, I think there, those are the rules of engagement at work, uh, including the free will he grants creatures, but also additional rules. I think actually the way the Old Testament in Jeremiah refers to uh, the way nature works. He talks about God making a covenant with nature. I think even some laws of nature, not necessarily what scientists think are the laws of nature, but the way nature works in an orderly way are part of God's covenant, his covenantal rules of engagement that are more than what takes place in the heavenly court with God and Satan. I believe God operates entirely in the world according to covenantal parameters in an orderly way so that creatures can have freedom and agency in the world and actually engage with God, even from a creaturely perspective in a way that they have agency in the world and can do meaningful things, including love and many, many other good things. When it comes to precisely how the rules of engagement work, uh, we see a lot of evidence of them, but we don't have a lot of articulation of exactly how they work in particular circumstances. So we have glimpses here or there, but there's a lot of mystery beyond that. And so I try very carefully not to speculate uh, beyond what is revealed uh, as much as possible because there are many things we do not know. And there are many questions I also have about how all this works. Um, but I, I am confident that there are such rules, but I don't always know what they are. I don't know what they are most of the time. Uh, all the time, really, I don't know what they are, except in the very case, few cases where Bible, the Bible mentions them specifically, uh, but they are there and operating in the background. And it helps me to remember there is much more to the story. God is working around and, and within and around impediments and factors that we, we cannot even dream of in some circumstances. So in, in, the, in some of the worst cases where we think, I can't think of any reason God might have for refraining from action, we have to remember that there are, there are many other factors that we just don't know about. Thank you. Uh, quickly going to another question, trying to accommodate as many as possible. Um, in a political setting, rules of engagement are usually made between factions or nations in conflict. Are we saying that God made rules of engagement with Satan? Do we have any comments of Ellen White on this point? Good, so good question. So. I use the phrase rules of engagement for lack of a better phrase. Um, I don't mean by that to imply that they function the way that they function in political context between nations. Uh, but I wanted to have the idea of rules that are particularly put in place between more than one party that are binding in some sense on both parties. And rules of engagement, the analogy helps because uh, even in warfare context, sometimes you have a much more powerful party that is binding themselves by some limits. They could do more, but they're morally binding themselves by some limits. Again, obviously, uh, there are many huge differences, so I wouldn't want to extrapolate from the analogy. And that's why rules of engagement is for lack of a better phrase. Uh, the rules of engagement are just those commitments that God has agreed to in the way that he governs the universe. Some of them are the result of the cosmic conflict, and they are somehow the result of proceedings in the heavenly 
counsel. Uh, and this is just what we see in the book of Job, where you have this hedge or this fence. Uh, as far as I know, Ellen White doesn't refer to rules of engagement per se, but she does uh, talk about the cosmic conflict a great deal and talks about uh, the way that God operates in the cosmic conflict in a way that can be described as self-limitation, where God limits his action morally in order to allow for the freedom and room for creatures to operate. And that understanding by itself is, is another way of referring uh, to what I call rules of engagement. Hopefully that clarifies. Thank you. Another question that that God endowed angels and Lucifer with free will to choose between good and evil in a perfect environment throws doubt on the perfect environment itself. Does not free will presuppose the existence of evil? And therefore the theological question, is evil a necessary good? Simply put, could God not have created free willed individuals in an evil free environment? Good, excellent. So God did give creatures free will in an evil free environment. So here we need to distinguish between the possibility of evil and the actuality of evil, okay? The possibility of evil, if love requires free will, if love requires freedom to receive love and freedom to give love, then love also must require the freedom to reject love. And I would make the case that one way to define evil is just that which rejects or is opposed to love. So if evil is that which opposes love and love itself requires free will, then it's true that love requires the possibility of evil intrinsically, but it does not require the actuality of evil. So there's no actual evil until a creature exercises their free will against God's love, but no creature ever needed to exercise their free will against God's love. So no, evil is not necessary Evil did not exist. Only the possibility of evil is necessary for free will and necessary because love requires free will. But there was no actual evil until creatures exercised their free will against God. And God couldn't have given creatures free will without actually giving them the possibility to do otherwise. He couldn't give them the kind of free will necessary for love if love requires free freedom to reject love. So the possibility is intrinsic to the nature of free will, not something God arbitrarily uh, introduces, but the actuality of evil is only brought into the universe by creatures and evil never needed to arise. If every creature had only and always chosen what God actually preferred, then there would never have been any actual evil in the universe. Okay, thank you. I think there is another question uh, connected to this. I'll jump to that. Uh, the question is this way. Does the actualization of God's ideal will depend on the exercising of human free will? Can you elaborate yeah. on elaborate on ideal will, remedial will, antecedent and consequential, etc.? Yes, good. Yeah. So I use I use a phrase that corresponds to to what some other theologians call God's antecedent and God's consequent will. I refer to them more simply as God's ideal will and God's remedial will. God's ideal will is what he wants to happen and what would happen if every creature always chose the way that he wants. That is, if everyone chose in keeping with God's love. Tragically, many creatures do not choose in keeping with God's love. And God has a plan for that as well, which I call his remedial will. I so use the word remedial will because he is remedying the situation or making it better. And so he's taking these free decisions that he doesn't want to happen and he's working around them in a way that doesn't contravene that free will to bring about the best outcomes he can bring about in a way that still respects that free will that's necessary for love. That is his remedial will. And so there are many ingredients, many factors, many causes that God himself is not causing. And God doesn't want to be the way they are because God does not always get what he wants. But he works alongside of those even bad decisions of creatures to bring about the best outcome that he can given those bad decisions. So God's ideal will, if God's ideal will is that every creature love one another perfectly, that everyone in the universe is in a relationship with, of love, God and creatures and creatures with one another, then God's ideal will just includes love. But love requires freedom. So God cannot unilaterally actualize, that is unilaterally make a reality, a universe, in which every creature freely loves him. Why? 
because you cannot determine that someone freely do something. There's a contradiction in terms, right? If I determine that you do something unilaterally, you're not free to do it or not do it. So if that's true, then love requires this kind of freedom. So God's ideal will, because it includes love, includes the freedom. And because creatures have rejected it, God operates with his remedial will to restore the universe back to his ideal will when every creature in the universe will once again fully trust God and there will only be love from all beings to one another for eternity. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions. If you have time, we will take them also. Absolutely. All right. Yes. Uh, the next question is, uh, um, here is a question. Uh, in the story of Job, Bible says Satan attended the council in heaven. Job 1.6, if Satan was cast out of heaven because of rebellion, how could he have uh, attended a council in heaven? Good. So there's a couple of things. So the heavenly council just said, just means that this is a celestial council somewhere in the heavens. It doesn't actually tell us anything about the geography of the rest of the universe and where the council is actually held. So it's a council with, with beings that is not on this planet, somewhere else in the universe, and we don't know exactly where it's held. And the, the, the casting down in Revelation is, there is an original casting of Satan out of, out, of, out, of, out of heaven, but the casting down in Revelation is probably referring to uh, Satan being excommunicated from the heavenly council at the cross. Uh, but he seems to be allowed to at least visit the council to make his allegations uh, up to the point of the cross, uh, but we don't really have any idea about where the council takes place or anything about heavenly geography. So I wouldn't want to, to speculate about that. Uh, but I would say that he, he is allowed to visit. And this is part of the question God asks, where do you come from? Is not because he doesn't know the answer. It's a procedural question. You know this because he asked the exact same question in Job 1 and Job 2. It's the exact same question. And Satan gives the same answer in both cases. So it seems to be, uh, what are you doing here? How do you have the right to be here? And Satan claims I'm here as a representative of the earth. In both cases, it's a procedural question. And that's why Satan appears to be allowed to make his case in the heavenly council because rulership was given over to him by the human rulers of this planet. When they fell, then rulership transferred to him temporarily. And this is why the gospel is much larger than we sometimes realize. This is why Paul speaks of Jesus as the second Adam, because he comes as the new ruler of humanity to come and take back, take back the rule of this earth for humans from the enemy who, who has usurped it from Adam and Eve. Okay. So Jesus comes as the new ruler. He triumphs over Satan and he takes back the rule of the earth that humans gave over to Satan. He takes it back on our behalf as the real human. This is part of the beauty of the gospel and what's happening in the cosmic conflict and in the book of Revelation and much more. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Most of the presentation was based on the assumption that God is absolutely good and nothing else. In this light, how to deal with verses that attribute evil to God directly such as Isaiah 45, 7, uh, Amos 3, 6, and uh, Isaiah 45, uh, sorry, Amos, uh, yeah, et cetera. Yes, good. Thank you for those. So first of all, the Bible consistently says that God is only and only, only, always righteous. Deuteronomy 32, 4, uh, you have Habakkuk. He can't even look on evil. And so the Bible is consistent that God only and always does morally righteous and good things. So the question is a good one. What about those texts where in some translations it says God does evil, like Isaiah 45, you reference, which in some translation says, I, the Lord, uh, create light and darkness. I do good and evil, right? That is sometimes translated that way. Well, in that particular verse, if you look at it, you will see there's a contrast there between good is, is tov there, and evil is the Hebrew word ra, but the Hebrew word ra can refer to moral evil, or it can refer to a disaster or a calamity, which is actually a righteous judgment. And in those contexts, it is referring to God's judgment against evil, not something he is doing that's morally evil. It's talking about when he brings judgment against evil, which is actually evidence of God's judgment. So the Hebrew word ra has to be translated according to its context. Uh, minimally, it just means something that is undesirable from someone's perspective, not necessarily something that's morally evil. It can refer to something that's morally evil, but it can just refer to a calamity or something that befalls someone that they don't like or find undesirable. So in those texts, it's referring to God's righteous judgment against evil. And it's very interesting that at least in the Western world today, many people look at the Bible and they say, why did God bring judgment against evil when he did? Whereas in the Bible, the people suffering cry out and say, why didn't God bring judgment sooner and more often, right? Because they're waiting for justice to come because God's judgment is actually what brings deliverance 
for those who are suffering and oppressed and poor and downtrodden. So God's judgment is good news. So all of those texts that talk that sometimes in some translations talk about evil, they're actually talking about God's just judgment, not moral evil. So they don't contradict the rest of the Bible that teaches that God only does righteousness. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you so much. Uh, we have come to uh, the last question, but I thought it is answered already, but then uh, it goes this way. Can't love exist without the possibility of evil? Yes, excellent question. And so in my view, no. If love is defined as requiring the freedom to freely give love and freely receive it, that entails the possibility of rejecting love. And if to reject love is itself evil, then love itself requires the possibility of evil. But, it does, but no necessity of evil and no actuality of evil. And evil is only actual because creatures misused their free will. But in the end, when the cosmic conflict is over, no one in the universe will ever again exercise their free will to go against God's love. And the universe will be free from pain and death and suffering for eternity. And every single creature will enjoy for eternity God's goodness and God's love and love fellowship with one another. In the meantime, let us live as if we have known and experienced the love of God so that we can love one another here on earth and show people a glimpse even a tiny glimpse of the love of our God reflected in our lives. Yeah, I already said last question, but this last question, I, I reserved it. Uh, one of the students uh, just sent to me that uh, in your, the introduction, we heard that uh, you're publishing a book every year. Uh, what is the secret behind it? You know? uh, let <laughs> us know. <laughs> well, it's not, it, it's, not, it's not every year by, by any means. Uh, but um, it is, I, I, have, I have been uh, blessed with circumstances and, uh, and opportunities, and I have just tried to uh, work diligently to uh, study and share uh, what I can, can find revealed about God in the Bible with as many people as possible. And one way to do that is to publish in academic works uh, what I believe uh, the Bible is teaching about God and his great character and his great love. And so I don't have any secret except to say that it is just a blessing and, and a privilege uh, to, to be able to, in some small way, hopefully help other people to see uh, the love of God as is revealed in scripture, uh, which is um, the, the, re the, the reason that I get up in the morning and, and teach and study and it is uh, a reason for all of us to be joyful and to do whatever we do uh, to the best of our ability, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might, not for your own glory, but for the glory of God. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Peckham. We, we want you to know that uh, we are thoroughly blessed by your presence with us this uh, today. And uh, you are a blessing to our church as a whole and the Christian community around the globe. And we want to praise God for such a talent in our church and may God uh, continue to use you mightily and bring more than one book in a year. And that's our prayer. And, uh, you know, our students are blessed and we are all blessed uh, by, you know, beautiful books that you come up with and write articles, of course. Thank you so much once again for being uh, with us uh, early in the morning. And I, I did not expect, but thank you so much and God bless you and your family and your ministry. Uh, I want to take this time to thank all the participants. I want to thank uh, Ms. Sharon and, uh, for the opening prayer and, and Dr. Mohan and uh, Dr. Jason Israel and Christian George for their responses. And we have uh, uh, all the students, you know, the a team of students work behind the promotion and uh, the poster and so on. We want to thank all of them. We want to especially thank the E.D. Thomas uh, youth team for the song service. We also want to thank all of you who joined us today and uh, may God bless each one of us. And we want to thank uh, Pastor Franklin who will be uh, ending the session with a prayer, the closing prayer and the announcement that our next uh, uh, forum will be next month. And that is on 21st November. Uh, this is going to be on a canon of the scripture. Uh, we have you know, several questions we may have. Uh, 
who authorized the canon and uh, uh, are there books out of the canon that God wanted it to be part of the canon? You know, several questions uh, students ask. So we save that day, November 21. We'll, uh, we'll let you know the details of uh, the presenter and other aspects in the coming days. Uh, the time now for closing prayer. If sir has the remark, may you make and then end the session with a prayer. Can you hear... Uh... Mr. Anish, yes, sir. Yes. I just would like to ask Dr. John Beckham, how has he explained this dilemma that he had with his son, Joel? In recent times, have you dealt with your son, Joel? I have, yes, yes. I've explained this to him and I use it to explain to him about the love of God and the, and the great controversy. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. <laughs> he understands now. <laughs> and someday we will understand too. God will explain it to us, I believe. It's almost parallel to Abraham and Isaac, I think. Mm. Not so much, but at least to some extent. Yes. Shall we pray? Our loving Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of Dr. John Beckham from Andrews University to all of us here at Spicer Adventist University this afternoon in helping us to understand the problem of sin, suffering, which is prevalent in this earth where we live. We thank you for the scriptures that have been used to help us gain an insight and to clarify our concerns and curiosities. We thank you for all the participants who have taken part in this Sabbath forum to make it a forum of value, a forum of understanding, and a forum for a platform to help us to understand each other and to know of thy love for us so freely given. We thank you for Spicer Adventist University and its student body for being engaged in this wonderful Sabbath afternoon activity. And so, Lord, we pray and thank thee for the solution that thou hast given us by the incarnation to dwell with us and be one amongst us to experience this suffering and to pay the ultimate price with thy death on the cross to make provisions for us to be liberated from sin and be forever free from suffering when you come again. So God, grant us the patience to be laborious as long as we live on this earth and to fulfill the role that thou hast for us and wait for the reaping to be done when thou comest and the clouds of heaven to be done by the angels at the end of time. Till then, Lord, grant us the peace that passeth all understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, I pray. Amen.